Hey y'all, this is Darren Van Dam, and you are watching Flick Connection, the show that connects you with the best movies on streaming. And today we're talking about 20 surprisingly good movies on Netflix. So this is going to be a ranked list of 20 movies currently included with Netflix that are all surprisingly good, meaning they all punch above their weight, they're better than some of their parts, they're much better than you think they would be. So there's going to be some movies on this list you've probably never heard of or some you've maybe passed on too many times and I'm going to tell you why they're going to be well worth watching. Let's go ahead and start though all the way at the back at my number 20 pick with a Liam Neeson action movie, yes, a Liam Neeson action movie. The Ice Road. What the hell was that? So this was released as a Netflix original, and like most of you, I am tired of the Liam Neeson action movies, and by the looks of it, Liam Neeson's getting pretty tired too, but The Ice Road actually worked for me. Now, I am not giving this tons of praise. Keep in mind, it is my number 20 pick, but for a Liam Neeson action movie, I really appreciated that they did something different. This isn't just some thriller where he's running around with a gun in the dark the whole time. No, he and Lawrence Fishburne of all people are ice road truckers and they have to do this big mission on an ice road. You probably already know the plot. It's something you've seen before, but even though the ice road is really familiar, I did enjoy it. I thought some of the action sequences were really fun. Again, for a quote unquote made for TV movie. Again, this is a Netflix original and there are gonna be several others on on this list, all ones that I consider to be much better than you would expect. The Ice Road is no exception, but again, keep in mind it is my number 20 pick. My next pick is a heist slash action movie, which everybody loves, but this one punches above its weight because it's just miles better than a low budget heist action movie ought to be. This movie is titled The Vault, and it's about a group of people breaking into this very elaborate vault. Now there are some elements of this Heists that are extremely far-fetched, yet they're still fun and thrilling to watch. All in all, The Vault is a pretty by-the-book heist movie. There's nothing revolutionary, new, or fresh in this movie, yet everything is delivered really well. It's all the things that you've seen in heist movies. There's the hacker, there's the engineer, there's people dressed up as janitors. I mean, you know, boilerplate kind of stuff. But again, it's all really well done, and again, it's just a fun watch, especially for something that's included with Netflix. All right, we're gonna dial the clock back all the way to 2004, which is almost 20 years ago now, if you can believe that, with The Girl Next Door. Now, this is a teen sex comedy that, again, like everything on this list, punches above its weight. Emil Hirsch stars in this as a young man who finds out that a former porn star has moved in next door, and they begin to become friends and have a relationship with each other. And this is not as dopey as it sounds. This movie kind of feels like a rated R John Hughes movie. There is kind of a hard edge. Again, she's a former porn star, but this movie is not super raunchy and is not gonna be inaccessible for most of you. It's actually a really fun movie. And because it's R rated, it's a little bit more adult. Even though I called it a teen sex comedy, it is more of an adult movie and it's quite good. It's got some funny moments, it's got some heavy moments. Timothy Olfant has a really great role in this as well before he was famous, so if you are a fan of his, you definitely need to check this out. But this movie is kind of a cult classic. But if you never bother because it just seemed like it was not for you, I can tell you this is a surprisingly accessible movie. Longtime subscribers know I've got a soft spot for South Korean gangster movies, and while there are not many on Netflix right now, there is a somewhat recent release that is actually a Netflix original called Night in Paradise. Now this one, like most South Korean gangster movies, gets quite violent and bloody, but it does have a slow pace to it in sort of the first third or so. However, if you like gangster movies and have not really introduced yourself into the South Korean gangster movie genre, there are better ones than Night in Paradise, but Night in Paradise could be a great place to start out. And like a lot of foreign movies on Netflix, they have a good dubbed version. Everything matches up pretty well if you don't do subtitles. But either way you go, Night in Paradise is an excellent gangster movie from South Korea. All right, I've got two Chris Hemsworth movies on this list. My next pick being Extraction. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> 
Now they're already about to release an Extraction 2. It'll release on Netflix later in 2022, but Extraction was surprisingly good for one major reason, and it was the way that this movie was shot, or more specifically, the way several action sequences were shot. They were done as one long take, or at least a couple of long takes threaded together and it keeps you in the action. Now this is not something new, it's been done in a lot of movies, but it's very complicated to pull off a big action set piece like that in one take. It requires tons of preparation, rehearsal, all of that, and you don't typically see it in these sort of straight to streaming or made for TV movies, but Extraction has it and it works really well because the story here is pretty thin, but the way that this was shot does give this movie quite a bit of extra weight, which is why it makes this list. Now another action movie that is much better than you would expect is actually from legendary director Oliver Stone. It's called Savages. Now hang with me for a minute because this is far from one of Oliver Stone's best movies. However, it's still a really great watch with the proper expectations. Now Oliver Stone's most famous for directing movies like Platoon, Natural Born Killers, and Born on the Fourth of July. But Savages is an action movie starring Blake Lively, and you've got plastic surgery John Travolta, and a lot of elements that seem pretty basic and not very entertaining. But even though this is not Oliver Stone's best movie, he did bring the heat with this one. I mean, you've got an amazing performance from Salma Hayek. She's playing an amazing villain in this movie. Benicio Del Toro brings the heat. The movie's got a great look to it, and it's got a harder edge than action movies like this typically have. Yeah, you get the exploding cars and the shootouts and stuff, but you also get some kind of visceral, up-close violence in this as well. In addition to that, it's a drug movie, it's a cartel movie, it's all manner of things, and they're all threaded to together by a really competent director and I think that's what makes this movie work so well. Don't go into Savages expecting an all-out action movie and don't go into it expecting an Oliver Stone classic and I think you will be pleasantly surprised. My next pick is a huge sweeping epic from India and I want you to hang with me on this portion of the review because while it is this big sweeping epic and it's full of tons of amazing visuals, lots of incredible action, it is from India and it does have some cultural differences that are gonna be a little odd if you're not ready for them. Now, this one is titled RRR, at least that's what it is in English. And as I said, it's this big epic movie that takes place while Britain was still occupying India. And they even give you a big disclaimer up front. None of this is based on reality. They also give you a disclaimer that the animals weren't hurt and that they're all CGI, which seems like a bad idea. Yet on the other hand, there are so many wild sequences with big predatory animals in this movie. They're all done with CGI. And to my American eyes, they don't quite look convincing, but this movie does make up for that with spectacle. It is this wild, amazing spectacle filled with action that doesn't look like anything that we really make here in the US. It's certainly influenced by it, but it's also unique to India in a way that I found really fun to watch. There were moments that I laughed out loud I thought were so silly, and other moments that really were holy shit moments that I was shocked by. This is a three hour movie that is honestly unlike anything else you're gonna watch on Netflix or even on this list. Some of you may even be familiar with Bollywood movies with all the singing and dancing. Some of that is in this movie as well. And again, to our American eyes in an action movie, it seems very out of place, yet it still is really entertaining. I mean, in Predator, if when Carl Weathers and Arnold Schwarzenegger locked arms, Son of a bitch. they immediately cut into this big song and dance thing, it would seem really odd. It happens in this movie. It seems odd and silly again to Americans, but it's thoroughly entertaining. This is a really fun movie to watch. My recommendation though is don't go into this just expecting another action movie. If you want to see something that looks and feels like something you've seen before, Disney Plus has all of that stuff. If you want to check out something new and different, RRR is a really cool watch. You will have to read subtitles and it is three hours, but honestly there's kind of an intermission thing in the middle. You could watch this in two sittings if you wanted to. All right, my next pick is the newest movie on the list. It just hit Netflix this month, and it's one I was pleasantly surprised by, Spiderhead. Time to worry about crossing lines was a lot of lines ago. This is the other Chris Hemsworth project, but this actually also stars Miles Teller and was directed by the same director as Top Gun Maverick. 
Keep in mind that movie was supposed to come out a couple of years ago. Spiderhead is an amazing Netflix original movie. Now, it is a small movie and a short story. It almost feels a little unfinished. Had I gone to the theater, I would have enjoyed this movie, but I would have felt like I wasn't quite getting my money's worth because it is, again, kind of done on this small scale. That said, this is a wild sort of mad scientist flick. Chris Hemsworth playing the mad scientist where they're testing drugs on prisoners. And not just any drugs, drugs designed to make you feel feelings of love and also fear and terror. It's pretty wild stuff. And the movie itself is you basically observing these experiments and they all play out really well. This movie is much raunchier than I expected it to be. It's kind of the nature of the experiment. And again, the story's small, it feels like it's over with kind of abruptly, but it's full of some fantastic moments. Chris Hemsworth giving one of my favorite performances of his outside of a Marvel movie. I've liked him in some other things, but he's really playing it up in this one and it was really fun. And Miles Teller too. I've liked him in things over the years, but he plays a much more serious character most of the time. And here he's having a little bit more fun and I really appreciated it again for a Netflix original. My next pick is another somewhat recent release that people slept on for too long, Beirut. In this movie, John Hamm plays a U.S. diplomat who is sent into Beirut by the CIA to help recover another lost American as civil war is essentially collapsing the city. So the civil war is happening in the background and what you get is a pretty good CIA procedural type thing. It's a spy movie. It's got a lot of really great moments in it, but more importantly, it's got a good story. The setup for this one really locks you into it where you want to go with John Hamm's character and bring back his friend. It's fantastic stuff. This movie's really well directed. It's got some amazing scenes of tension and it's just well produced overall. There's nothing too cheesy or light. It handles the subject matter really well. If you like good, tense spy movies, Beirut is top-notch stuff. And then the last movie in my bottom 10 on this list is a talky movie, but it stars Jessica Chastain in one of her best roles and Idris Elba in Molly's Game. So this is actually written by famous screenwriter Aaron Sorkin, but it's also the first feature film he directed. While I don't think he brought anything really fresh to the table as a director, I can say he did direct his script incredibly well. In fact, the directing and the production and all that sort of takes a back seat to the actors really delivering you Aaron Sorkin's lines. Now, this is based on a true story, and the screenplay is actually based on a book by the real Molly Bloom, who was an Olympic skier who ended up running the world's most exclusive high-stakes poker games. Games played by really rich people, movie stars, politicians. So this Molly person was also somebody with a tremendous amount of power, a legal battle ensues, and you end up with a really fantastic drama that has a lot more going for it. And you end up with a really fantastic drama with a lot going for it. Great script, great directing, great performances, and a really interesting story to begin with that was actually written by the person who lived it. So if you like talky dramas at all, this is easily one of the better newer releases currently included with Netflix. So here we are in the middle of the list and before talking about my top 10 movies, I do want to tell you to go check out DarrenVanDam.com when the video's over. I've got movie recommendations right there on the homepage as well as links to some of my recent videos and you can sign up for my free newsletter while I will actually email you movie recommendations straight to your inbox along with some extra fun stuff. I even include links to trailers in that email that way you can just click them, check out the movies and kind of have your viewing set for the week. It's free to sign up, but going over to the site and doing all that definitely supports the channel. But speaking of the channel, let's get back to it and move on with my top 10 on this list. My next pick is a modern warfare movie that's based on a true story about an Afghanistan outpost that comes under heavy, heavy fire. Not only does this have some fantastic battle sequences that are really well produced, but it's also got a lot more than just this big incursion sequence. There's actually quite a bit of story that develops at this particular base with different characters and not dry stuff either, things that just don't have anything to do with the actual fight towards the end of the movie. But that said, this movie has a lot in common with movies like Black Hawk Down. The production is not to the same level, but 
you do feel like the production respects the story, so nothing's cheap or cheesy, and you've got a pretty good cast in a middle tier movie like this. I mean, there's Scott Eastwood, Caleb Landry Jones is always great, and then Orlando Bloom. It's one of the best things I've seen him in in probably a decade. If you like war movies at all of any era, the Outpost is a great watch, but if you particularly like modern warfare movies and haven't seen a good one in a while, I'm telling you, this is easily the best one on Netflix right now. If you want even more action, my next pick is a Jackie Chan flick, but it's one of the more surprising ones he's done in recent years. It's called The Foreigner. Now, Jackie Chan is retiring from action movies, this being one of his last big action movies, and what's so great about The Foreigner is he is playing an older man in this movie. I know he doesn't look it, but Jackie Chan is almost 70 years old, so it's great to see him embrace his older years in one of his final action movies, because as much as I love all those old classic Jackie Chan movies, it's really cool to see him as an old man whipping people's ass. And what's great about The Foreigner is it's not just this crazy action movie where an old man's beating people up. No, it's actually a really good revenge flick as well. Not only that, but you get Pierce Brosnan playing an excellent bad guy who isn't just this mustache twisting villain. He's got a little bit of a kind of compromised morality that works really well for the story and is a little more complicated than you typically get in action movies like this. But the movie itself does get pretty wild. Jackie Chan does go for it with this one. He pulls off some amazing stunts and this movie's filled with great moments. If you've been a fan of Jackie Chan's in any way, shape, or form over the years, even if you're only really familiar with Rush Hour, The Foreigner is gonna make a fantastic watch on Netflix. All right, my next two picks are sci-fi movies that were not featured on my recent sci-fi list. I'll put a link to that video in the description if you want some more sci-fi picks. But What Happened to Monday, I think, is one of the best Netflix original sci-fi movies. The setup for this is that in the future, overpopulation has become such a problem, people are only allowed to have one child. And if that sounds far-fetched, let's keep in mind that China did that for quite a while. This, though, is on a global scale, and Numi Rapace is playing, which I just Googled it. Apparently there's not even a name for having seven kids. <laughs> they go to sextuplets with six and then it's just a high number after that. But a woman births seven children and because they all look the same, they name them after each day of the week and that is the day that that person is allowed to leave the house to try to hide the fact that there's seven of them and not just one. That's the basic setup. What's interesting about this though is Numi Rapace is playing seven different characters. She's doing all of them quite well. They're all different. And when one of them, named Monday, does not come back home, the rest are left to figure out what happened. And again, you get amazing action sequences in this one. I mean, action sequences that remind me of like Leon the Professional, yet they're sci-fi. And then the story becomes so rich and layered that the slower portions of the movie are just as interesting as the action sequences. Honestly, easily one of the best sci-fi movies Netflix has ever made. Now my next pick is a sci-fi movie and it is lower budget, but you cannot tell. They did such an amazing job with the effects in this movie and it's from Canada. It's called Code 8 and it's actually based on a short film by the same name that was so successful they were able to raise enough money to make this amazing movie. This takes place in a future where some humans have powers. It's something we've seen before. There's nothing really new or fresh there. What's interesting about Code 8 though, is it is illegal to use your powers and there's this robotic police force that is going to enforce that ruling. So after a pretty tight setup, chaos ensues. The story works on this movie. It's got fantastic visuals. The powers everyone has is really interesting. To me, this movie was better than most of the X-Men movies, certainly better than the last couple that they put out. And it's a fair comparison as well. So if you're like me, you like stuff like that, but maybe weren't too happy with the last handful of X-Men movies, Code 8 is a great replacement for that. Okay, if you're still hanging with me on this list, but I've maybe talked a little bit too much about action movies, you like artsier films, this next pick is probably gonna be for you, yet it's pretty off-putting, so listen up closely to Nocturnal Animals. On the surface, this movie looks pretty straightforward. Amy Adams and Jake Gyllenhaal play ex-husband and wife. He finally writes a novel, sends it to his ex-wife, yet as she's reading it, it sounds maybe like a veiled threat. Not only that, you actually get to see the story play out as she's reading it, and it is a West Texas thriller. 
This movie does go into some dark directions, but it's got a very interesting and unusual plot that comes to fruition. It's not one that should leave you very confused. It's got amazing cinematography and some incredible performances, including one from Michael Shannon. And Aaron Taylor Johnson probably gives the performance of his career in this movie. Seriously. I'll also say it is an artsier film. Be prepared for the first five minutes or so to be one of the weirdest things you've ever seen, but if you can muscle through that, this movie's got a lot of rewards in it for you. Colin Firth is one of those rare actors that as soon as they win an Academy Award, they somehow magically become even better. He's literally at the top of his game. The Staircase on HBO Max, if you haven't watched that, it is maybe his best performance ever. And he also does a great job in my next pick, Operation Mincemeat. In five weeks, 100,000 British forces will strike Sicily's southern shore. Unfortunately, the Nazis know of our intentions. So we're going to play a humiliating trick on Hitler. This is a fantastic World War II spy movie. It's based on a real plot to fool Hitler and the Third Reich into thinking the English were attacking on a specific front. Meanwhile, they were gonna do something completely different. And it required an amazing level of subterfuge. But as much as I love spy movies, I kinda liked them even more the further back you go in time because there's less and less resources to be had. And deception requires a lot of ingenuity and cleverness, but to see spycraft carried out during World War II it's fantastic stuff and then to have it led off by not just Colin Firth, but Kelly McDonald's also got a really great role in this as well. I'm telling you, history buffs, people that love World War II stuff, this is easily one of the better things Netflix has added in a while. Believe it or not, a documentary does make the list of just shockingly good movies. And this one was also nominated for a ton of awards just last year, My Octopus Teacher. Now, the reason this one makes the list is because it does something dramatically different than any other nature documentary I've ever seen, probably anyone ever done. This is about one man developing a relationship with a solitary octopus. Now, as weird as that may sound, the octopus is not much larger than his hand, so this movie doesn't go into really bizarre territory or anything like that. But what happens is he learns so much more about the way they are, the way they live, than he ever could have by just kind of casually observing. He's going back to the same spot every day, seeing this octopus almost every day, and he's not only just able to observe this solitary octopus throughout its entire life, it's actually bonding with him, recognizes him, and is displaying levels of intelligence really never recorded on camera before. I mean, you've probably seen a cool video of an octopus getting out of a jar or something, but this is on a different level, and it actually puts you in touch not just with an octopus, but with nature in a level that documentaries don't seem to be able to do very often. There's always a removed layer, and My Octopus Teacher kind of breaks that down a little bit in a way that I found just completely compelling. All right, I'm a big Jason Bateman fan. I like almost everything the man does. I loved Arrested Development, absolutely loved Ozark. Not a big fan of Teen Wolf 2, but that's fine. But if you're like me, you like his work, you need to check out The Gift. Now, there are a lot of movies titled The Gift. It's a simple name. This is from 2015. Not only is he fantastic in it, you also get Rebecca Hall. I always love her and everything, but you also get Joel Edgerton doing one of his best roles as this really creepy character. In addition to that, though, Joel Edgerton actually directed this movie. This is the first feature film he ever directed, and he directed the pants off of this thing. If you love classic Alfred Hitchcock thrillers, I'm telling you, you gotta see The Gift. If you love Ozark, you gotta see The Gift. If you're a fan of Joel Edgerton's, you gotta see The Gift. This is an amazing thriller that goes into some dark territory, but there's nothing spectacular about this one. There's no car chases, there's no shootouts, there's nothing supernatural happening. Everything is pretty simple, but it is incredibly chilling the way that this thing was brought to life. Incredibly well directed, and again, this one is gonna stick with you after you watch it, so you've been warned. All right, we're all the way down to my number two pick. My next pick is a big movie. It's one I expected to like. And I gotta be honest, after leaving the gangster movie genre for over a decade, me and I don't think anybody expected Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman to be half as good as it was. Yeah, all right. Got a bit of Wagyu in the freezer as it happens. Oh, I never had Wagyu. Yeah, well, it'll be wasted on you, but it's all I've got. 
For those that don't know, Guy Ritchie is most famous for directing some really fantastic gangster movies from England. You've got Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch, and Rock and Roll, which was done in 2008. And then he went on to do some big budget movies like Sherlock Holmes, King Arthur. Yes, he wrote and directed Aladdin, if you can believe that. And not only that, he's working on Aladdin 2 right now. But I've got a hunch that he's using all that Disney money to fund producing the types of movies that he wants to make. Because since doing Aladdin, he has created three movies. One is yet to come out. The other two are fantastic. The Gentleman being one of them. What a fun gangster movie this is. Not only is it a classic Guy Ritchie gangster movie, but it's glossier and prettier than his other movies, which were gritty and dark and kind of grungy. This one is really polished and clean and, and has an incredible contrast to his earlier work, yet the dialogue is still there. It's snappy, it's witty, a lot of it is improvised. Matthew McConaughey is doing a fantastic job in this movie. I mean, you've mostly got English characters in his movies, but for someone like McConaughey to come in and actually fit into a Guy Ritchie movie, I feel like that's pretty special. And this movie is fun. It's got its dark moments, but it's got a lot of really fun moments in it as well. Again, just nice, crisp dialogue. It's not quite Tarantino, it's, it's English, it's dry, and it's, damn near perfect in this movie. If you haven't watched it, it's a ton of fun. That's why it's at my number two pick. But with all of that, as excited as I was for The Gentleman and everything else on this list, what could possibly be number one? It is a movie I have talked about on this channel quite a bit, but it's probably been well over a year since I've gushed about how much I love Hell or High Water. Start the car! Now, for Yellowstone fans, look no further. This is your movie. If you've never seen it and you love the show Yellowstone, congratulations, this is your new favorite movie. This is written by Taylor Sheridan, most famous for creating Yellowstone. But Taylor Sheridan also wrote Sicario and Wind River. And I will say, Hell or High Water is his most fun movie by far. In this movie, Chris Pine and Ben Foster play a couple of brothers who start knocking off banks in Texas. And what's so great is there's a little bit of a Robin Hood theme. Then you get Jeff Bridges trying to bring them to justice. It's fantastic stuff. And what's so great about Hell or High Water is you're kind of rooting for both sides in a really unusual way. You've got Ben Foster and Chris Pine playing these two brothers and they're doing a fantastic job. You really understand why they're doing what they're doing and you, you're in for the ride with them. But at the same time, Jeff Bridges is playing this fantastic, lovable character like he usually does, and you want him to succeed too. So you're constantly rooting for both sides in this movie in a really fun way. There's some great heist sequences that are never done over the top. They feel like real, quick bank robberies. All of that stuff's great. There's an amazing soundtrack and just a really great overall look and feel. This movie's glued together incredibly well. It's one of my favorite things currently included with Netflix, but that is the list. Let me know if you've got any additional recommendations in those comments below. I do read them and one of your recommendations might make it onto a future list. You can also go over to darrenvandam.com for additional movie recommendations. I've got some right there on the homepage and while you're there, you might as well sign up for my free newsletter where I'll email you movie recommendations straight to your inbox. I'll even include links to the trailer so you can check them out. But I will keep making these videos as long as you keep watching them. Thanks for checking out this special Netflix list and you will see me on the next one.